Welcome back to Economics. This is Dr. Kling, and today's topic, and this will be a long talk, is called The Great Debate. So back in 2010, Russ Roberts and John Popola unleashed on an unsuspecting public a rap video called Fear the Boom and Bust about the conflict between Friedrich Hayek and John Maynard Keynes. Now you won't see Russ Roberts in the video, I'm pretty sure. Uh, they have professionals uh, doing the rapping and doing the acting. Uh, but Russ is kind of the creative person behind it, or w with John Popola. Uh, Russ Roberts, as you may know, uh, has some associations with the world-famous Melvin J. Berman Hebrew Academy. He doesn't teach there the way I do, but he teaches. He actually teaches at George Mason University, but his wife teaches here, and uh, he said his children go here. So this, notice that this had 2.783 million views, and that doesn't count the views when it was translated into other languages and, uh, showed, and uh, shown there. So just an, uh, an incredible hit, and it concerns what I call this great debate. <coughs> and while I'm at this page, I got to this page by just going to YouTube and searching for Keynes Hayek rap. Uh, they did a follow-up called Fight of the Century that came out about uh, six months after the first one. And that rap is actually... Uh, I think intellectually a little neater and uh, in terms of production values uh, even better. And it also uh, was a big hit, although it didn't have quite the shock value that the uh, the first Keynes Hayek rap video had. Okay, so this great debate can be framed in terms of we can put Keynes on one side and Hayek on the other. Now, <coughs> they actually had their uh, debates in the, uh, pretty much in the 1930s. Um, so they were kind of part of the early 20th century debate. However, um, Russ and John Popola are not the only ones who focus on their debate in the 20th century. There was another kind of famous video called The Commanding Heights. And The Commanding Heights talks about mostly the debates that took place in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, but they were be between, the, they were over the issues that were raised by uh, Hayek and Keynes. So what is this great debate? I think the great debate can be described as being over limited government, a philosophy of limited government, versus a philosophy, I'm going to call it unlimited government. Basically, government should go with unlimited government, government should go wherever there are problems and solve them. Limited government is a fear that government will cause problems by trying to solve other problems. And maybe a quick summary of the debate. Um, and I would argue that this debate uh, goes back to certainly the early 1800s, probably not before that. Um, but let me point to a book. The book is called The Mind and the Market, uh, Capitalism and Western Thought. So it, and it's a very difficult book. I, I think if you're really interested in this topic, at some point you should read it, but probably, uh, probably shouldn't be the first thing you try. Um, it's a, um, a real treatise on um, the historical attitudes about people that people had about capitalism. Um, and interestingly enough, it's by uh, a fellow named Jerry Muller, who lives uh, in Camp Mill, so lives even closer to me than Russ Roberts. Um, 
but I don't think he sent his kids to the academy. I think he sent them to uh, Brand X. So anyway, I think this debate you can certainly trace in the United States back to the early 1800s. And obviously it isn't between Keynes and Hayek. Um, I could say it's between Lyman Beecher and maybe, oh, I don't know about James Madison, um, or maybe Andrew Jackson. And maybe on this side we'd put Jackson's uh, big opponent, John Quincy Adams. Um, these are sort of the, the early versions of this debate. Um, and I get a lot of this, I just have to recommend another book here, which is uh, What Hath God Wrought? Uh, it's a history of eight, about 1815 to 1848. Um, it's by, um, I think it's Daniel Howe, H-O-W-E. Okay. So... Um, you know, Lyman Beecher, by the way, was the uh, ancestor of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. So in the early days of this great debate, the people on this side were for things like, okay, these were, think of this as people from Massachusetts, and they're descendants of the Puritans, and they have a code of purity. And think of these people as being from Virginia, descendants of the Cavaliers, and they have a code of honor. So this code of purity leads these people to favor, they're, they're always trying to improve their society. So temperance, that is getting rid of alcohol, they're at the crusade against alcohol. Anti-slavery. Women's rights. Um, and then You know, in, you know, down to a modern day, uh, this purity is anti-obesity, anti-smoking, and um, environmentalism, sort of anti-carbon, if you will. And back in the um, early 1800s, they were in favor of what was called internal improvements. So the government should get involved in building roads and canals and so on. Okay, in the Virginia school, they were focused more on things like states' rights and just... Uh, more traditional forms of behavior, sort of traditional manly behavior, if you will. And so if a man wants to get, have a little, have a drink every now and then, that's fine. Uh, not as concerned with women's rights. Uh, obviously not concerned with fighting slavery. So that's um, kind of, that's the, uh, original history of all that and then you know but we could <coughs> and always focused on honor so more than purity so if your honor is insulted you you fight back um, you can see this code of purity versus code of honor in reactions let's say to 9-11 to you know more recently 
the code of purity says, you know, why do they hate us? What, do, what have we been doing wrong? And the code of honor says, we better go out and kick some you-know-what. Um, so this uh, code of purity versus code of honor uh, lasts a long time. And in fact, uh, it's described in some other books. So I'm going to bring up... This book is called Special Providence, American Foreign Policy and How It Changed the World by Walter Russell Mead. And it also carries on this kind of sectional uh, division in American politics. He divides it into four groups. Maybe I'll write them down. Um, so he has his four groups are, maybe I'll write it down somewhere down here, um, Hamiltonian, Wilsonian, Jacksonian, and Jeffersonian. And the Wilsonian is, I think, the one that would be the the code of purity. And we're, you know, in terms of foreign policy, we're trying to, to sort of purify the entire world. And Jacksonian is the code of honor. We just want to fight back when we're being fought. The Jeffersonian is more, um, let's, uh, it's more isolationist in foreign policy. Let's just um, worry about ourselves. It's a little bit related to the purity idea, but the purity includes just staying away from uh, any foreign entanglements. And the Hamiltonian is more interested in commercial relations, foreign policies about uh, you know maintaining markets, um, and so that it doesn't really fit in with the, with the others. Uh, I bring that up because you can think of Walter Russell Mead as being a popularization of a book called Albion Seed: Four British Folkways in America by. Uh, David Hackett Fisher, uh, another historian. And that book um, traces, you can argue, traces these things to the first settlers uh, in America with sort of the <coughs> um, the Wilsonian, uh, I might not get this exactly right, but with the, let's say the Wilsonians being the Puritan set settlers the Hamiltonians being the um, sort of the Quaker settlers, maybe I'm stretching that, the Jacksonians, the what's called the Scotch-Irish, um, and I'm not sure where I'd put what, what uh, the Jeffersonians would I guess be the Virginia Cavaliers, so it's, I'm stretching it to uh, to associate with the, exactly those four, but that's um, there is a relationship between Mead and uh, Hackett Fisher's uh, description, and, and it's just interesting that you can really go back to these original settlers. And what Hackett Fisher does is take these settlers back to their their original places in England, and you can I think trace some of this great debate all the way back in in that sense, all the way back to the uh, to England and the the different views that people had uh, who then came to settle in America. Okay, let's talk more about this conflict. One way to describe it is is a conflict of visions, and I'll show you that book in just a second. Um, the one vision is the unconstrained vision and the other is called the constrained vision and the unconstrained vision says that basically people can be perfected and we're sort of on the road to perfection and society can be perfected. And the constrained vision says 
No, actually, uh, people are imperfect. And in particular, um, government is flawed. People in power are dangerous. And so you can see how the unconstrained vision would lead you to a view of unlimited government because, you know, if society can be perfected, why do you want to, you know, and government is going to be an instrument for perfecting society, instrument for perfecting society. You know, why would you ever want to limit it? Whereas if people in power are dangerous, then, uh, then you want to have checks and balances and you want to have constitutional limits. On government. So on this side of the of the um, of the great debate, uh, people take this the constitutional notion of enumerated powers seriously. So the there was this doctrine that if the powers are not explicitly given to Congress or the president, uh, then they go back to the states, and those that are not explicitly given to the states go back to the people. Uh, so that there's this constitutional limit on what government can do. And the unconstrained vision thinks that's nuts. Uh, why would you, if you're in the process of perfect, perfecting society, of getting rid of some of these ills like uh, drunkenness and slavery and um, you know inequality of women or obesity and smoking and carbon that's going to uh, you know um, cause climate change why would you limit government in its ability to uh, fix those ills and take care of those problems Anyway, this, I've been using these terms constrained vision and unconstrained vision, and those come from uh, another book by Thomas Sowell, a conservative writer. It's called A Conflict of Visions uh, by Thomas Sowell. So I just wanted to give that, uh, give that reference. Next, I'd like to talk about some divisions within the great debate. So I'm going to divide these two sides up a little bit. So within the um, the unlimited government camp, we have full-blown anti-capitalists um, <coughs> you know, so um, you know, Marx fits in there, just wants to get rid of the capitalist system entirely. Um, and then we want to have people who would say they're trying to save capitalism from capitalists. In fact, there's an, another book of that title. I don't think it's, I haven't read it, so I'm not going to put it up there, but uh, in sort of save capitalism from its excesses, let's say. And people would generally put Keynes in that camp. In fact, there are a lot of people on the left who say, why do you people over here, why do you have so much against Keynes? He actually saved capitalism. Uh, he figured out how to stabilize uh, the macroeconomy to, you know, uh, stop having such huge business cycles. He, he's, he's a guy who saved capitalism. Um, so, the <coughs> so there are some people who believe that Capitalism has lots of excesses, and they all need to be fixed, but um, still there's something worth saving. And on this side, people who hold this cons the uh, constrained vision, who think that man is imperfect, we're not going to get to perfection, um, the, the two divisions sort of, one puts, um, it's okay if, 
government is less limited but conservatives are in charge. And the other group says it's um, it's okay if conservatives are not in charge, conservatives not in charge, but the important thing is the government should be limited. So this is the, what I'd call the libertarian wing, and this is the traditional conservative slash neocon wing. So if you, I, I once gave a talk at the Hoover Institution, and I gave one of my, and, I, and I'm over in here, and I gave one of my pretty far out libertarian things, and I could tell uh, I went over like a lead balloon there. Um, and the more libertarians, uh, there's Cato, uh, is famous for being a libertarian think tank. Uh, something like Hudson Institute, I would put more in the traditional slash neoconservative. Um, yet another interesting sidelight on this is the role of of Jews in almost all of these uh, very, these camps. In fact, um, I'll point to another book um, called Capitalism and the Jews, and this is again by Jerry Muller. I don't think it's as good as his Mind in the Market book, uh, but it gets into a lot of this um, this history of um, <coughs> of the Jews being in various uh, prominent places on this whole thing. Uh, so, um, let me see if I can put them on this scheme. Obviously, you know, you can, you know, Marx uh, had Jewish origins, and in some ways, I think he, his narrative of um, capitalism versus labor, you can argue he's sort of borrowing a story from the Exodus, where the evil capitalists, he would never want to admit something like this, but is Pharaoh, and labor was the Hebrews in the original um, Exodus story, that uh, Marx was really doing, creating a, vil a villains and victims story that could kind of appeal to, that just has this biblical appeal, and he just uh, but brought it up to date with capitalists and labor. Um, and I think that's, that's a, a lot of the emotional appeal uh, comes from that, and I think people still, uh, still like that. Um, you know, in, incidentally, going back to this, or my original Code of Purity, Code of Honor uh, story, um, you might think in terms of the Occupy Wall Street movement as part of this kind of code of purity that the um, the richest one percent are impure, they're evil, um, and the Tea Party movement is the code code of honor that they just feel insulted by, uh, they, that their constitution has been insulted by the progressive movement and Barack Obama. So. Um, um, you know, this, you know, 200-year-old division between Massachusetts and Virginia on code of purity versus the code of honor, I think we still still can see that uh, in the Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party movement. Um, and I think the Occupy Wall Street movement would be in the anti-capitalist camp and would see people in terms of villains and victims. Um, on the Keynesian side, we have, I would say, most academic economists. Uh, certainly the academic economists on the coasts. And so you have people like Samuelson. And I remember we're st I'm ta discussing how, you know, Jews here. Um, and so a lot of Jews are in academia. And so you have people like Sam Paul Samuelson, famous Keynesian. Uh, and many others, um, you know, to, you know, living, you know, we'd have people like Alan Blinder, 
Um, and again, I could <coughs> come up with, with many names. Okay, the neoconservative, traditional conservative, well, we know about that, you know, neoconservative is almost synonymous with Jews. Um, Irving Crystal, and then his, who's, who died, and then his son William Crystal. Um, and there, um, um, that, this neoconservative view grew somewhat out of the uh, a reaction to the way the Vietnam War protests went. They felt like that um, the hostility to traditional values and this hostility to um, um, to America went too far. That these people, you know, the the purity, the moral purity view, came to be anti-Israel because in terms of villains and victims, they thought, well, the Palestinians look like victims, Israel looks like a villain, so that's the way this w we're going to view uh, the world from our, this uh, code of purity perspective. And that, um, and a lot of the neocons were Jews who were supportive of Israel, and so they reacted against that, and that's why that helped, that made them turn neoconservative. But my point here is they didn't care that much about economics. Irving Kristol uh, quite famously wrote that he didn't care that much about economics. So they were willing to reconcile with um, big government in order, as long as the people in charge of the government had a more conservative view on social values, because they thought that the uh, the new code of purity, which included uh, support for abortion rights and um, sort of um, you know sort of rapid uh, not worrying about the decline of the family, uh, they they thought that was bad. That these these people want to keep sort of traditional families. So, if you have traditional families and strong foreign policy, this, we don't need this anymore. Traditional families and strong foreign policy, then the, you've got the neocons happy, and, and if if government is still doing a lot, that's fine. And that view, in some ways, can be traced back to Bismarck, who was very conservative, but who. Um, in the end came in with the first uh, kind of welfare state policy. So I sometimes call these people Bismarckians. And then finally we have the libertarians, and yes, there are, are Jews active there as well. This is a book, Radicals for Capitalism. It's called A Freewheeling History of the Modern American Libertarian Movement. And it uh, it's a great book, by the way, um, and the uh, um, it gives sort of five major figures in the libertarian movement. Uh, a fellow named Mises, Hayek, who we've put at the top of this thing, of this column, uh, Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, and Murray Rothbard. Okay, and of all these, Mises was Jewish. Ayn Rand was born Jewish. Uh, she didn't pay much attention to religion overall. Uh, Milton Friedman Jewish, Murray Rothbard Jewish. Now, no, now none of these were um, you know, observant Jews or um, focused on their Jewishness, but it just it so happens that four out of these five were born Jewish. Um, so they, you can see them uh, kind of all across Jews all across this uh, this spectrum, uh, from the um, you know some some on the Keynes side, some on the Hayek side, some on the side of unlimited government, some on the side of limited government. Um, so what would the um, you know, what would these people say today about themselves and about each other? Um, so 
so the what I, I call the church of unlimited government and the church of limited government so what these people would say about themselves is that they are heirs of the great causes you know we supported anti-slavery we supported uh, getting rid of Jim Crow laws we supported women's rights and you guys over here were against us all along the way um, and these guys don't have a great defense against that, uh, although um, uh, so the the on the Jim Crow laws, the the actual the disagreements were more sectional um, than philosophical. Well, although Barry Goldwater, who was on the limited government side, uh, was against using the federal government to overrule state laws, so to his uh, ultimate regret. Uh, so he did, uh, he, he did take the wrong side on that one. But this was mostly a sectional dispute, uh, so that there, you know, a, when the civil rights bills passed in the 60s, there were uh, Southern Democrats who were opposed and Northern Republicans who supported. Uh, anyway, that's, um, y I think you still have to give the, un the unlimited government people the fact that they were on the side of getting rid of the Jim Crow laws and the limited government people said oh let the states decide themselves which meant that the southern states could could keep the Jim Crow laws um, but some of the causes that uh, were supported in the past were not such great causes remember they were for temperance and ultimately that became prohibition prohibition did not work out so well and the other another dubious cause was eugenics. Uh, for a while the um, the people who believed in unlimited government were very big on eugenics but um, at when World War II came and, and Hitler got involved with involved with eugenics in a big way uh, with the Holocaust uh, they they decided eugenics was not such a good thing they crossed that out so they they claim in fact to have been more anti-Hitler than these people, um, or anti-Hitler first, and in, and there may be some truth to that because uh, when Hitler attacked Russia, that meant that people on the left all of a sudden turned around from being kind of neutral in the war uh, to being very much. Um, you know, because Russia was fighting Hitler, then you know, then th that said the good guys were fighting Hitler. Now, in retrospect, instead of talking about um, being sort of pro-Russia because it was communist, uh, the history of of American involvement in World War II, we we really have become. Uh, especially since 1961 when the Eichmann trial took place we've we've talked about the Holocaust and so um, the uh, World War II now becomes this great cause to uh, you know somehow uh, in favor of Jews and against the Holocaust when in fact uh, that really didn't figure into our uh, to our thinking at all in terms of getting into World War II. Um, and in fact, um, there is an argument that one of the causes that was embraced was fascism. And this is a very controversial argument. There's another book by Jonah B Goldberg called Liberal Fascism, The Secret History of the Left from Mussolini to the Politics of Meaning, and Goldberg's, uh, what Goldberg's trying to do is um, point out all the ways in which the, uh, doc this, this sort of doctrine of, uh, that I'm calling the doctrine of 
unlimited government was very congruent with fascism. Um, and that, it, certainly people on the left, you know, find that offensive. They don't, they, they think of themselves as anti-fascist. Um, so it's a, and they've, they've got some, some good points in, in a, a number of ways. They, what I would, you know, I associate fascism with a uh, support, really strong support for violence to hold power. And I think it's a, a real stretch to say that, that there are many people on the left or the uh, unlimited government side who, who support this. Yeah, there were a few um, who believed in the use of violence and, um, you know, the, there were some violent revolutionaries but um, I don't think that's the core of the of the belief of people on the left today, and so I think that um, um, so I, I'm not <coughs> I'm not really ready to throw the word fascism at that, but but certainly um, so w what they what I think might be more congenial as a description of what uh, people who, who want sort of unlimited government want would be something like democratic socialism. That is, they don't want the uh, the hard fist of fascism at work, but somehow if if voters would vote for large use of government, then that would be good. So another thing would be democratic. I'll call it democratic elitism, which is sort of an oxymoron, right? Because democracy has, says we're all equal, elitism says that there are elites, and that's I think there's this big tension in on in the thought on this on this sort of unlimited government side is that um, they very much uh, champion democracy and we're all equal, but they also champion a form of elitism. That is that there are people with moral and, uh, um, let's see, well, moral wisdom and know-how who should be in charge. So you all you often call they so they want non-political technocrats. Like the Independent Federal Reserve is a great progressive institution. A great institution for those who believe in uh, unlimited government, government that's going to reach in and solve every problem. They want it to be, so they want non-political technocrats in charge, but sort of voted in democratically. And as Jonah Goldberg points out, a lot of the early social science was focused on creating these technocratic experts. So the American Economic Association was formed in part to <coughs> uh, develop these kinds of technocrats and there were the people, you know, the early founders of the American Economic Association were very much associated with progressive causes including things that were later discarded like eugenics. Um, so it's not a, uh, an unblemished history there. Um, So the mainstream economists of the American Economic Association see market failure in many places and think that a technocrat can and should correct market failure. <coughs> and that assumes, we think, those of us who disagree think that that assumes that the technocrat is not constrained by moral flaws or by lack of knowledge. Um, and so, um, and they think that the technocrats shouldn't be constrained. Um, so um, 
again, they always believe that society can be improved, and one of the things that they go for improvement would be campaign finance reform. So those of us who disagree would say, well, technocrats lack information. That's Hayek's criticism. So Hayek's view is that technocrats don't have all the information they need. And we also worry that they have moral flaws. Um, we'll, in another talk, I'll talk about use the term rent-seeking, but you can think of rent-seeking as corruption. So we think that there are moral flaws that even technocrats are corruptible in some sense, maybe not um, inherent because they're corrupt as people, but the system can uh, eventually be corrupted. The solution, again, for corruption from someone who has the unconstrained vision is something like campaign finance reform. And people over here would say, you know, campaign finance reform isn't going to solve it, people, that, that there's inherent ways in which the political process will be corrupt. So that's kind of where the great debate stands now, is that um, on one side are people who really, see, you know, they see market failures, we could fix them. Why, you know, why aren't we doing more to fix market failures? And on the other side, there are people who see, well, even the technocrats actually have less information than markets. They're not as smart as they think they are. And the system is inherently can, can be corrupted. Um, and so it won't work as well as intended. And again, that's where the great debate stands now.